Imagine a country that goes from having just 22 large dams to owning more than half of all the large dams on Earth, all within a single lifetime. And imagine doing it while lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty, electrifying some of the most remote regions on the planet, and building the world's largest hydropower stations that can power entire nations on their own. That country is China. And the story behind this transformation is far bigger than engineering. It's a story about energy, food, survival, national power, and the future of global technology. When the Communist Party took power in 1949, China had almost no hydropower, just 163 megawatts nationwide, barely 9% of its total electricity capacity. The country was mostly rural, poor, and struggling to feed itself. So the new government launched a massive national effort to control water. On big rivers, they dreamed of modern mega dams. But on smaller rivers and canals, they relied on millions of ordinary villagers working with simple tools. The goal was clear, bring more water to the fields so the nation could survive. This campaign exploded in scale. By 1959, China claimed to have nearly quadrupled its irrigated farmland. Under the slogan of the three priorities, small-scale projects, locally built, and locally manufactured equipment, China constructed around 40,000 small reservoirs in just its first decade. Most were dug by hand during the Great Leap Forward. At that time, hydropower wasn't yet the priority. Soviet advisors pushed China toward large dams, but the country lacked the steel, concrete, and technical expertise to build them. Worse, the big Soviet-guided projects that were completed, like the Fazling Dam and the Guanting Reservoir, performed poorly. So Chinese leaders shifted direction. In 1955, the Minister of Agriculture admitted openly that China simply wasn't ready for large-scale dams. If the country wanted to boost food production and rural development, it had to focus on small-scale water conservancy and small hydropower. Then came the breakthrough that changed everything. Those tens of thousands of small reservoirs weren't just good for irrigation. They created the perfect head of water needed to generate electricity. With a little extra construction, a village could turn a hand-dug reservoir into a small hydropower plant. A 1954 booklet captured the idea perfectly. Make water do the work. Instead of simple water wheels barely touching water's potential, China began converting that force into electricity. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, small hydropower stations appeared everywhere, on dams, canals, irrigation ditches, and mountain streams. By the late 1970s, China had developed seven different types of small hydropower systems, including versions powered by rapids, waterfalls, and even tidal flows. The 1970s became the golden age of small hydropower. Over 43% of China's total hydro capacity came from these tiny locally built systems. In the South and Southwest, regions full of rivers and mountains, counties relied almost entirely on small hydropower. By the early 1980s, 770 counties depended on it, and 70% of them were located in rugged terrain. This changed rural life dramatically. As agriculture became more efficient, millions of workers moved into township-level industries, factories producing cement, fertilizer, paper, textiles, and machinery. These factories ran on cheap electricity from small hydropower. Operating costs were just 2 to 3 fen per kilowatt hour, with electricity selling for 5 to 6 fen. It was the cheapest rural energy source in China. In Sichuan, small hydropower produced nearly three times more electricity for rural areas than the national grid. Profit margins were almost double those of small thermal plants. And then came the social transformation. In counties like Yongchun, by 1979, electricity reached every village and 92% of households. Families got lighting, radios, TVs, rice cookers, and electric kettles. Kids studied at night. Villagers watched films in community halls. Manual labor dropped, free time increased, and entire communities stepped into a new world. What made this revolution possible was localization. China didn't create a giant national company to run everything. Instead, counties designed, built, and managed their own hydropower systems. Some set up turbine factories. Yangchun alone built over 800 hydropower turbines. 
By the early 1980s, local factories nationwide were producing more than 85 types of turbines and over 100 types of generators, including micro-units as small as 0.25 kilowatts for remote mountain communities. In total, around 200,000 hydroelectric equipment sets had been manufactured. This wasn't just development, it was innovation from the bottom up, and it didn't stay within China. By the late 1970s, international experts were praising China's achievements. At a major energy conference in Montreal, specialists called China's small hydropower expansion remarkable, highlighting that the country had installed over 80,000 units in three decades. Soon after, the UN and UNIDO organized a study tour for delegations from 16 developing countries, essentially asking China to teach the world how to electrify rural regions using simple, local technology. But while China built thousands of small dams, it also began a parallel push towards some of the largest dams ever built by human civilization. This is where the story scales up dramatically. China began in 1949 with just 22 large dams, defined by the International Commission on Large Dams as structures at least 15 meters high, or 5 to 15 meters tall, that store more than 3 million cubic meters of water. But the pace that followed was almost unbelievable. By 2011, China had built so fast that it owned more than half of all the large dams on Earth, essentially constructing the equivalent of one large dam every single day for 60 years. Today, that number has soared to roughly 22,000 large dams, making China by far the largest dam-building nation in the world. Hydropower became essential for a country rapidly turning into the factory of the world. By 2024, China was consuming around 9,000 terawatt-hours of electricity, not only more than double the entire United States, but more than the combined electricity consumption of the US, the European Union, India, Russia, and Japan put together. Nearly 59% of this was used by industries producing steel, cars, smartphones, computers, and global electronics. Hydropower became the backbone of China's industrial rise. Today, China has 436 gigawatts of hydropower capacity, by far the largest in the world. Its share of hydropower in the national energy mix is 13.45%, more than twice that of the United States. China is also home to the world's biggest hydroelectric giants. The Three Gorges Dam, at 22,500 megawatts, produces more power than the entire electricity demand of several countries combined. The second largest dam in the world, the Baihatan Dam, with 16,000 megawatts, is also in China. Five of the world's 10 largest hydropower stations are Chinese. Yet coal still accounts for about 58% of China's electricity. Because coal drives massive carbon emissions, China has set a goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2060. To reach it, the country is investing heavily in renewables, especially hydropower, which provides stable, round-the-clock, low-carbon energy. And then there's the newest force shaping China's energy future, artificial intelligence. AI data centers require enormous amounts of electricity, sometimes as much as entire towns. China expects AI-related electricity demand to reach 200 terawatt-hours by 2025 and 600 terawatt-hours by 2030. OpenAI recently warned the U.S. government that America must add at least 100 gigawatts of new power capacity every year to keep up with China in the AI arms race. In 2024 alone, China added 429 gigawatts of new electricity generation capacity, while the U.S. added only 51. OpenAI called this the electron gap, the energy gap that could decide who leads the future of AI. But China's dam building is not just about power, it's about water, food security, and national survival. China has 17.2% of the world's population, but only 6.6% .6 of its freshwater. And the distribution is wildly uneven. Northern China, home to Beijing, Tianjin, and major agricultural zones, faces extreme water shortages. The Yellow River often ran dry before reaching the sea in the late 20th century. Meanwhile, southern China, especially the Yangtze Basin, holds nearly 40% of the country's freshwater. To bridge this gap, China built the world's largest water transfer project, the South-North Water Transfer Project, with three major routes carrying water thousands of miles to the north. 
The central route alone required raising the Danjiangku Dam and channeling water all the way to Beijing. China's total water storage capacity is now around 1 trillion cubic meters, which is greater than the United States' total storage capacity. But despite this massive volume, China's per capita water storage is still less than half of America's, because China has a far larger population. Even with these huge reservoirs, without this storage, China's farmland, cities, and industries would face severe water shortages. Dams also protect China from devastating floods. The Yellow River and Yangtze have caused some of the deadliest floods in human history, like the 1931 disaster that killed around 3.7 million people. Today, 185 billion cubic meters of China's stored water is reserved just for flood control. For China, Dams are not just infrastructure, they are symbols of national capability, technological strength, and geopolitical leverage. Many of Asia's major rivers originate in Tibet, giving China upstream control. On the Mekong alone, China has built more than 10 dams, influencing the water supply to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and others. This upstream position gives China strategic negotiating power whenever regional disputes arise. From tiny village turbines to mega-projects that reshape entire continents, China's dam-building story is a story of survival, ambition, and global transformation. It's about how a country that once struggled to irrigate its fields became the world's largest builder of dams, the world's largest producer of hydropower, and a rising superpower in the global energy and AI landscape. If you enjoyed this deep dive, make sure to like the video, share it, and tell us your thoughts in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more in-depth content just like this.